Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the second of our third online event focusing on cybersecurity in space and, and good evening to colleagues in Australia. Um, my name is Tim Pynchon, I'm Head of Communications at the Satellite Applications Caspolt and uh, we are delighted to be running these workshops in partnership with the British High Commission to Australia. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about the Satellite Applications Caspolt, we're a UK-based independent research and technology organisation uh, founded by Innovate UK in 2013 and we're here to support the growth of the UK satellite industry um, and we do that through our mission which is to innovate for a better world empowered by satellites. Um, today's event is looking at space and cyber security and what needs to be done um, and we're joined by three fantastic speakers um, that I'll let John introduce shortly but um, I would just want to encourage you, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to have these, these three speakers here um, today. Um, so please do make use of the, the chat and the question and answer screens on the webinar to ask your questions. If something interests you sort of at any point throughout the session, please ask it and uh, John will then facilitate and put those answers, they put those questions to the speakers towards the end of the, of the session. Um, and I also want to put in a plug uh, after the uh, after the session tomorrow, we also are going to be running an online networking event for anyone who has attended these um, events over the three days. Um, later on today, we'll be sending out a, a reminder about that with a link to go and set up an account um, on the networking platform that we're using. So please do that ahead of time and then you'll be able to join us and talk to speakers or to each other following the event tomorrow. Um, and so that's it from me this morning. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John VC, who is, um, who has, who works at the Cas Satellite Applications Catapult, and uh, he's currently head of health and well-being at the Catapult. And but he has a very strong background in government services sector, um, including work in cybersecurity. And so John is going to facilitate our session this morning. Over to you, John. Thank you, Tim. And uh, as you said, welcome to to all attendees, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for giving up your time to uh, come and hear this discussion and this second session. Uh, so I'm going to start by handing over to our, our first guest speaker, David Livingston, who's director for Napier Meridium. Uh, David has a long standing uh, record in delivery of cybersecurity strategies for not only international institutions, national governments, but also industrial organisations. He's the original systems architect for the virtual task force methodology uh, for collaborative management of cybersecurity risk that has now been rolled out in a number of industrial sectors, both in the UK and also overseas. So it's great to be able to welcome it to this session. David, over to you. Right. Thanks very much indeed. And, and hope right. Let's uh, go for the good old screen share here. Um, good morning. Good evening uh, to colleagues both in UK and Australia. Um, just see if I can get that to go to slideshow. Um, <clears throat> and here we are, second session. Some of you might have seen me yesterday chairing, um, but I thought I'd sort of give my own thoughts about what needs to be done in the space and cybersecurity uh, conjunction. But um, just sort of summarizing yesterday, the, you know, the scale of the challenge, um, you know, we really don't know how much goes on in, um, uh, in uh, the space and uh, cybersecurity area, underreporting, people don't know they've been hacked and so on. But what we are seeing, um, our threats are beginning to understand the importance of space uh, as an enabler for infrastructure and therefore the ability to disable space or to hijack it or whatever, um, not just in its own right, but also use it as a pathway uh, to attack other infrastructure. And of course, if the if we don't, if, you know, address the vulnerabilities, then, then the risks will rise. And we'll come back to uh, some of that with an illustration uh, in a little bit. Um, I thought I'd just uh, go into the mining sector because I know Australian colleagues are particularly interested in this um, and look at the um, one of the later reports. I'm afraid it is uh, you know two years old, but that is the latest from Ernst & Young about cybersecurity risks in mining and metals. Um, and it's now number three generally in uh, corporate risk registers. And uh, it's actually over a single year actually rise uh, by nine places on that uh, uh, Ernst & Young uh, risk indicator in terms of uh, the, the business risks uh, facing a, a really rather important sector, especially when we start thinking about digging out rare earth metals to feed future economies and so on. And of course, there we go, industry 4.0, you know, heading towards cyber and physical systems. You know, this is remote and autonomous systems uh, of the future. <clears throat> and of course, because of the democratization of space, 
we're going to find that more of the pathways to control that infrastructure um, that, uh, in, in the sort of uh, industry 4.0 is going to be space infrastructure uh, dependent. And therefore, it's uh, cyber risks uh, don't just manifest themselves in the space sector themselves, but also the sectors that uh, will be affected if we don't secure um, the space environments from cyber risks. So there we are, <clears throat> the connected mind. This is the future. Um, this is a Komatsu truck. It doesn't mean to say Komatsu is any more vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, space and cyber, but this is an autonomous truck, you know, no, no people. That means it can work hard. Uh, you know, in the future, we don't have sort of watch bills and shifts of, uh, you know, trained people. This is the benefits of industry 4.0 and just a key, a few keystrokes away and bad things would happen. And whether that's, uh, you know, spoof, spoofing of GPS systems or a pathway through to the truck itself to drive it off the side of an open cast pit. And all of a sudden, all the benefits of, you know, mining 4.0 uh, start to look suspect as we as we retrospectively try and engineer cybersecurity into our systems and retro engineering cyber into established systems um, is always more difficult and you always <clears throat> leave gaps. So um, Quentin Tarantino and Kill Bill, uh, chapter five, the interesting case of the talk talk hack. Uh, and I think a lot of us are company executives uh, on, on the line at, at the moment, you know, seeking to set up our own, our own companies. And the talk talk hack, and this was about sort of five years ago, um, and uh, they had a, uh, a, a, a it was a 19 year old kid in the end, just sort of wondered if he he could get uh, you know into the talk talk, um, and talk talk is a telecoms company um, and uh, uh, UK based, and all doing very very well until we had uh, a bit of a hack, and what was actually lost money, data, intellectual property. Rep, you know, the, the, the loss of company reputation, they lost identities um, uh, and so on. So, so this is actually the scale of the, the talk talk hack. Um, and <clears throat> here was the famous interview on a, a UK uh, current affairs program called Newsnight, where the CEO was asked by uh, the interviewer whether the customer's bank details have been uh, uh, um, encrypted by talk talk. Uh, and she said, the awful truth is, uh, I don't know, um, which actually then, you know, at executive level of the company, uh, actually said that they did not have cybersecurity under control. And the outcome of that for Talk Talk uh, was a, a rapid decrease uh, in the share price. Around January 15, you know, market rumors, there's been a hack, they've lost all this data, uh, you know, hasn't been encrypted. And then slowly down, uh, down the time, the, you know, the famous interview, another fall in the share price and the value of Talk Talk. Um, and then, uh, you know, despite, uh, you know, customers wishing to, uh, um, you know, end their contracts and they weren't allowed to, as soon as they were allowed to, customers then, uh, you know, were, were then moved on to other companies which showed cybersecurity responsibility from board level down. Uh, and Talk Talk started off at 70 pence when it was first formed, and believe it or not, it's now uh, heading down towards 70 pence, you know, per share from um, about three pounds per share uh, at the height of its prestige and before the cybersecurity uh, incident, which they uh, did not manage very well. So that shows the executive importance of, um, uh, of getting cybersecurity risks under control, get them on the risk register uh, and bring it to the attention. Uh, you know, it is the attention of uh, senior management within the companies. Um, and there she is. Um, this is um, uh, 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 the then executive of, uh, of Talk Talk. Uh, who is now running the National Health Service Test and Trace System here uh, in the UK uh, in response to the COVID-19 epidemic. And, and uh, that's going uh, you know, really well, isn't it? Um, but anyway, that's the importance of, of addressing cybersecurity risks inside an enterprise, not specifically space related, but this is the effect it will have uh, on your company values if you don't have the correct risk mitigation strategies in place. 
So the, um, so the nature of losses, yeah, money data, this is what they lost, you know, it wasn't encrypted. The market then understood that cyber wasn't done. And of course, uh, the point I wish to make is the company value absolutely tanked uh, and forced the, re in the end, forced the resignation of Dido Harding, uh, uh, I think two years after uh, the original hack. This company value uh, is, the, is the key point here, an insufficient investment uh, in cybersecurity can really have bad downstream effects on, on your company. And here's Louis Gerstner, former CEO of IBM. Uh, in the end, an organization um, is nothing more than the collective capacity of its people to create value. And that, that really gives you, you know, a clue about what we have to do to create or even maintain value. It's collective capacity, uh, which, is the important, uh, which is the important point. So where are we now? Three uh, areas of space. The first space age was, uh, you know, this uh, national prestige program, you know, Apollo versus Soyuz. And then, of course, we had the, uh, the, the, the second space age, you know, the big heavy lift, uh, you know, sat satellites and satellite, you know, capacities. These are, you know, huge in, you know, in government, private, in, uh, you know, programs. But actually, as we all know now, we're all heading into the third space age, um, which is really it's about the applications of the economic benefits that space provides in terms of, you know, critical national infra infrastructure and the way that we actually conduct our lives, uh, you know, in the, in the current day. And of course, in the future, as we head through to industry 4.0 uh, as well. So the three ages of cybersecurity rather reflect that. I think we all remember when our, our, our antivirus came through the post every three, well, some of us do anyway, uh, every three months, uh, you know, on floppy disks, uh, and then we loaded it all up and, um, and of course, that that looked at uh, you know antivirus and firewalls, and, and that the system centric approach didn't work. So then we added a little bit, which is about how to look after our our data, um, uh, you know, and encrypt it and 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 so on. So we added systems to data uh, uh, centric approaches, and of course, that still didn't work. We still didn't get these risks under control, and so now I, I really do believe that we're into an organizational approach. Um, and there's Abe Lincoln, and I'm just going to paraphrase his Gettysburg address, which is cybersecurity for the people and by the people. And I think that's the key point is that cybersecurity becomes everyone's uh, responsibility throughout the workforce from chairman of the board all the way down to individual worker and indeed the cleaner that comes in uh, during the quiet, hour, uh, quiet hours all have some kind of role or, or uh, uh, responsibility in terms of delivering cybersecurity to maintain company value uh, um, and, and uh, not uh, uh, and not have a cybersecurity uh, tragedy that needs a lot of clearing up. So what I'm suggesting here uh, as I finish um, is really to, uh, I think we're probably at the beginning of, of some uh, thinking about developing a UK Australia space cybersecurity regime. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, it's a set of, you know, uh, space uh, regime is a set of implicit or explicit principles, norms, uh, rules, and decision making procedures around uh, which actors' expectations converge in a given area of international relations. And, and you know, obviously, the, the UK Australian, uh, you know, is, is a set of, you know, international relations. So regimes offer a way to inform and organize effort in policy uh, whilst remaining loosely federal rather than being overly centrally directive, which, reduce, which, which, um, which reduces the ability to create tempo inside the cybersecurity, uh, um, uh, uh, inside the cybersecurity domain. So what I'm suggesting is the purpose of a UK Australian cybersecurity regime um, would be really to advance collective capacity on space and cybersecurity, uh, focused on the development of uh, joint economic prosperity. That is absolutely the aim. And so what will the functions be? The first is, I think, as we're trying to do now, is increase bilateral understanding of space cybersecurity challenges, <clears throat> market drivers and solutions. 
Um, and then develop non-regulated organization-centric approaches based on collaboration, shared market awareness, knowledge, uh, and joint capacities, finding each other's strengths and, and where um, our count, you know, counterparts are, are not so strong, and then trying to find that mix where we actually end up with a pure blend of, um, uh, of match skills uh, and indeed ambitions uh, to promote uh, joint UK, uh, Australian space cyber products and services, not just nationally, but on the international stage as well. Um, and that is where I'll leave it, John. Thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you, David. That's, um, yes, it's really interesting um, perspectives, but also really interesting challenges at the end. And um, great that we can hand over now to, to Giles Rothwell, who's uh, a Director for Security Testing and, and Assurance at, at CyberCX. Um, not only because of, uh, I think it's a, a nice follow on from what you were describing, but also Giles's background, having 26 years of experience in, in information technology, having joined CyberCX in 2015, he's worked with a range of clients to provide proactive cybersecurity strategic advice assessments, um, sorry, security assessments of production systems and networks, as well as penetration testing. Um, so I think it'd be really complimentary to hear his experience in providing that sort of IT disaster recovery, business continuity to, to the ISO standards uh, across multiple clients and platforms. So, so Giles, over to you, please. Oh, you'll need to unmute Giles, sorry. Apologies. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, David, for your introduction of, of highlighting some of the risks in our area. Um, that brings in beautifully to, to where I wanted to start. Um, I will share my, uh, my slide deck. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, I wanted to bring a, a slightly different perspective to things. Um, I think, you know, as, as David has highlighted, um, I think the world is and enterprises are becoming more aware of cybersecurity, whether they're doing enough is questionable, I would agree. Um, but what I wanted to bring was uh, an area that we're starting to focus an awful lot more on is actually understanding risks within your supply chain. Um, it's an area that we find is significantly, um, I wouldn't say ignored, but perhaps underestimated uh, across the industry. Um, if we look at um, aerospace as an industry, um, one quote I found is possibly it's the pinnacle of complexity in the sense of uh, if we look at um, the quote from the, the, uh, the space shuttle, NASA said they used 3,800 um, different suppliers in building the space shuttle. I accept that's probably a little bit out of date now, um, but I can't imagine that situation's gone any different. Um, and therefore, you potentially have 3,800 other organizations um, that may have access to your data, that may um, have integrations into your enterprise, um, that may um, contain your intellectual property. Um, and it's an area that, you know, uh, people are starting to take cybersecurity with their own enterprise seriously, but do they actually understand what's going on in the, in the wider uh, environment? Um, and the other aspect I wanted to bring as well is that um, we talk a lot about the cybers. Um, it's a beautiful buzzword these days. Um, and we see Hollywood films with the hacking going on and all the, all the clever stuff, but actually, Information security um, at its core is about more than just um, cyber security. Um, there are other aspects in relation to the classic CIA triangle is obviously um, integrity and confidentiality with your data is, is perhaps the thing people um, think most about. Can somebody access it who shouldn't? Um, the classic hack scenario. But actually, um, from an enterprise and um, uh, importance perspective, the bit that's often forgotten is around the, the availability. Actually, um, is your data or is your supplier's data um, available? Are they able to service um, the requirements that you have for them um, to keep your supply chain going? Um, so I wanted to focus on a few bits and pieces um, around that. Uh, just a, a shameless plug um, for two seconds. So we've done an awful lot of work in this area. We run a number of global programs for some very large enterprises. Um, looking at people's supply chain um, and auditing them against various standards. But we don't just look at sort of technical cybersecurity. We look at the whole information security maturity around an organization. So we, we don't just look at actually do they have lots of vulnerabilities in their environment that could allow somebody to, to access their data um, inappropriately. But we also look at actually do they have controls in place 
to recover from security incidents if they had some kind of ransomware incident or if they if even less um, uh, cyber than that, if they had a fire, if they have some kind of incident that makes their information unavailable and their ability to service you as a supplier. So we look at um, a number of standards across not just technical information security, but business continuity, disaster recovery, um, and how they would handle an incident in that event. Some of the questions I'm going to ask you um, are, you, and that we come across regularly when we look at this is, do you actually know who all your suppliers are? Do you know that, um, uh, all the people you deal with? Could you come up with a list if I asked you to do it? Um, in most organizations, we find that actually is really quite difficult. Um, do you know what they do for you? Um, uh, do you actually have a process flow? Um, and do you know what information they have access to? Do you, do you understand what information they hold? Do you un are you able to assess the risk of what information they hold? That could be, you know, um, uh, your your uh, um, sorry words completely gone. That could be your your data, your core assets, uh, designs, anything like that. Um, and do you know how you interact with them? Do you understand the processes? Do you understand what connections they have to you? Um, do you if, if uh, and this is where, do you have a plan B, if one of your suppliers had a security incident such that uh, maybe they got hacked or they got some kind of malware on their network, do you know actually how you could cut them off? Do you know how you could protect your data in that scenario? Um, the questions, the answer to that question in most instances that we find is actually, that's really quite a complex, um, a complex thing and doesn't always, uh, isn't always obvious. So what I would say is um, when, to understand your supply chain and to control the risks associated with it, um, do you actually communicate to your suppliers what your um, expectations are around their security? Um, do you uh, communicate to them your minimum standards, of, you know, your minimum requirements for security? What controls do they need to put in place to control your data, their data that they need to service your requirements? Um, do you even have those discussions? Uh, in many scenarios, um, that's not, not even done, but actually, should it be even at a contractual level, do you set out some basic requirements to say, actually, you must adhere to these standards? Um, again, do you talk to your suppliers? Do they understand your uh, security requirements? Do you um, raise awareness with your suppliers of your requirements um, in what is a very technical industry? Um, and also, uh, can you provide support in the event of an incident? If you have an incident, would you know how to communicate to your suppliers that you had issues going on? Maybe you, you can't get data to them that they need to provide you with the service that they, uh, that they do. So then it comes down to, to managing the risks and how can you do that? Um, one is, uh, as we said, is actually you need to communicate your, your requirements. Um, what the basic controls do they need to put in place? Um, you need to require that compliance, whether at a contractual level or, or whatever. Um, communicate those standards and very often one thing that we found um, that has pretty much been a requirement when you're actually looking to understand your supply chain and control the risks about your supply chain is actually they may send you a whole load of documentation they may be 27,001 certified they may say we do all the right things but actually do you know that can you prove that um, uh, and one of the things we've built into a number of the supply governance programs that we do now is actually the right to audit. Can you actually go and check that your suppliers do what they say? Do they meet your minimum standards? And then if you do that, actually, if you find that there are issues or there are gaps, um, do you act on it? Um, can you act on it? Do you have the right to act on it? Can you tell your suppliers what you need to do? Um, those are all considerations that need to be thought about. But what I would say is actually it's not about it's not about dictating and telling it's about encouraging and promoting good behaviors um, and in particular it's building trust with your suppliers uh, this is one of the challenges that we've had um, running these kind of programs is initially very, very initially a lot of suppliers think that actually um, it, it's, it's around uh, being checked being tested it's about passing an exam um, it's about being seen to meet those requirements for you and, and uh, giving them confidence that they have security in place to, uh, to control your assets. But actually, it should be seen as a collaboration. It should be seen as working together to achieve um, the uh, reduction of risk across the environment. 
So it's about actually making it a collaboration. If you find gaps, if you find problems, it's not about beating them over the head and saying they have to fix it. I mean, clearly, yes, that's part of it, but actually it's more about working together to address those risks. Um, and particularly, potentially uh, providing advice and support. And that's probably one of the big areas where that we bring into it. Um, uh, the other thing is where you do find issues, it's important that actually you allow time for those improvements to take place. Um, but that particularly because Certainly, uh, if you have a major supplier and they're heavily reliant on you for their business, they're going to want they're going to want to please you. They're going to want to fix any issues, but actually, you need to give them the time to do it so they do it right and they do it in the right way. Um, but the other thing also is about listening to what their issues are and working collaboratively collaboratively um, to make sure you address those. But one of the key things that we found constantly is actually maintaining communication uh, and maintaining that relationship to make it work for both parties. Um, and the objective of any kind of supplier management process is really is to identify risks that are not part of your organization, but could directly uh, affect your, uh, your organization. Um, have some standards and manage those with your suppliers. Um, we operate a sort of risk-based um, approach. So um, actually look at what are the key things that need fixing um, and address those, those high priority items. Um, and Creating one of the things we do is create a dashboard um, so that actually you can monitor progress over a, a prolonged period uh, and understand where your suppliers are. Um, but one of the key things actually that we've also found is, is providing management oversight so that actually your senior management understand any risks within your supply chain um, and, and can uh, uh, react to that. Um, so have a key reporting structure, stakeholders and people that understand what's going on. Um, and that government models allows you then to, to manage that relationship. Um, one classic thing, and, and David sort of brought in and mentioned it and sort of, as I come to a close, but David mentioned uh, cleaners are part of your information security. Um, that sounds very foreign um, or a very odd concept, but actually one of the things that we've actually needed to address and look at is cleaners are allowed into buildings often out of hours in, in a relatively uncontrolled environment, but actually do you have non-disclosure agreements in place with your, with your cleaning company so that any data or information that's left around the office or that may be visible um, is, is, is secured by that? So they have uh, some controls over that. In many cases, it, it can be some very simple controls that are uh, what's required to, um, to put in place and manage some very simple risks. But the question is, do you actually understand what those risks are? And, and, and that's the different aspect I wanted to bring today. So I think uh, I've put a slide in around questions, but I think we're going to move on to questions at the end of the session. We are. Thank you, Charles. Um, and finally, before before we move into those uh, question and answer session, answer session for for all of our speakers, it's uh, it's a privilege to introduce Andrew Beck, who's our director of service delivery at Miriota. Um, after joining the business in its first year as the, as the eighth team member of Miota, um, Andrew oversees operations of the of the network, including the nano satellites and cloud infrastructure, but was previously uh, the principal engineer for cloud architecture at Miota between 2016 and 2018. Um, he previously held roles at TTPCom, uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know, that that's an innovative mobile technology company in Cambridgeshire um, and has great experience across uh, being able to bring them from his personal hobbies, whether that's sailing, forging, home renovations and anything that brings that opportunity to stay calm in the face of calamity. Um, so that's a really positive thing to be bringing to infrasecurity and uh, cybersecurity, as I'm sure we'll hear uh, in due course. So. Andrew, over to you and, and your slides. Thanks very much, John. Um, Giles, I think you may need to stop sharing so that I can take over the screen share. Thank you. So I'm going to jump into the weeds a little today and um, give my perspective as an actual operator of uh, satellite mission um, and in particular what I'm going to do is draw the thesis that um, the space industry and particularly our concept of operations for satellite missions is at an inflection point and 
what's going to happen in the coming years um, is going to resemble a lot of what we've seen in the cloud space um, with the explosion of massive web scale applications and platforms over the previous decade. And in particular, this is going to have huge implications for the way that we operate those systems and also the cybersecurity um, kind of implications associated with that. Before I do that, I'm just going to quickly jump into um, just an introduction to Muriota, um, the Australian scaler. The term spun out of the University of South Australia five years ago this month, and which I've had the great joy of working for for the past four and a half years. So Muriota was formed with a very straightforward objective of providing I, uh, connectivity to IoT devices everywhere. I used to say on planet Earth, but obviously these days our horizons have shifted a little to Moon and uh, the Mars and to Mars and beyond. But um, there's a couple of critical attributes to, that an IoT network must satisfy, and those can be summarised as uh, it must be ultra low cost. Devices must have very long battery life, and the, the whole network must be able to operate at very at, at massive scale. And of course, the whole point of the discussion today is security must be baked in from the start. The days of adding on security at the end of the process is those days are long gone. Um, and similarly, we can't add security as an op optional extra for some customers or some applications. It's got to be there for everybody. And that's the, uh, that's the approach that Myriad has taken. Now, the way that we've solved that connectivity problem for IoT devices is via direct to orbit communications. And specifically what I'm talking about is tiny IoT devices with battery lives measured at 10 years or above, communicating directly to a constellation of satellites in low earth orbit. And this happens without the need for any kind of additional terrestrial uh, infrastructure such as repeaters or hubs or um, kind of any kind of terrestrial backbone. What this allows is for, like it's very simple um, and very low cost for somebody in a remote location, for example, to deploy a single device without requiring any other infrastructure. Uh, and this is just simply enabled um, use cases and applications that were not available before. Now, the challenge here is, um, is scale. Now, a single satellite at an altitude of five to 600 kilometres over the centre of Australia, the footprint covers most of Australia. And that could include potentially millions of devices. And so the problem that Muriota identified and solved was a problem of um, communications. Specifically, how do you get all of those devices to communicate with one satellite um, you know, while, it's, while it's in view? And when I say that we've solved this problem, I mean, we've really solved it. So from day one, thanks to one of our seed funders, we had satellites on orbit. And since over the last five years, we've transmitted millions of messages between IoT devices uh, and, and those satellite, that satellite network. Now, Muriota works with a number of partners and those partners span a, a bunch of verticals. Um, those include say environmental monitoring, which includes farmers monitoring um, the level of water in their, in their tanks in remote properties to monitoring groundwater in the artesian basin to monitoring the ocean currents in the Torres Straits. It includes continuous meter monitoring um, from locations and at a cost that just wasn't possible before. It also includes tracking and monitoring assets, assets which might include vehicles to machinery to, to giant wind turbines um, operating all around the place. And of course, um, the defense and intelligence community communities are very interested in, in Muriota's um, offering. Backed by a strong portfolio of, of over 20 patterns now, um, we saw Boeing participate in our Series A fundraising, um, which happened to be their first ever uh, investment outside of North America. And then more recently, uh, Inkito invested, uh, participated in our Series B. So Put simply, the capabilities that Muriota's um, developed, uh, just simply they've created a market that didn't exist before. So as with the um, previous speakers, I think that cybersecurity often comes back to the, uh, the CAA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now in the context of the Muriota network, what we have is 
low cost, low power IoT devices that are encrypting and cryptographically authenticating or cryptographically signing their messages at the, at the device. And then those, those messages travel through the space segment and ground segment unmodified to the relative safety of the, of the cloud where those messages are authenticated and then decrypted before forwarding on over secure links. Now, obviously we operate um, point to point security at all segments of, of our network. But the point is that by having um, encryption and cryptographic signatures operating across the entire ground and, and um, space segment, what that means is if a adversary is able to get a foothold in any of those, in any of those nodes, they're simply not able to either view or modify or um, intercept in any way the network data that's traveling across that network. What that does is it leaves us with um, the, the, the outstanding problem and the focus of much of our effort, which is availability. And so assuring availability across that network is the key challenge for us from a cybersecurity perspective. It's not to say that um, securing, you know, key distribution and all those other challenges go away, but focusing on the, um, the space operations, availability is our, is our primary challenge. And as it happens, availability at scale has a lot in common with what we've seen with the, uh, with the massive um, explosion of the huge web platforms over the, over the past decade. Now specifically, what we've seen in the web space and what we're, what we're seeing now emerging in space operations is hyperscale. What hyperscale means is that the systems are exploding at exponential rate in terms of size and complexity. And the teams that are tasked with operating uh, those systems, they need to be able to grow at a linear rate in order to operate those um, exponentially, um, those, those systems that are growing exponentially. And that's kind of the definition of, of hyperscale growth. Now, how does that happen? one of the big innovations that's happened in the cloud space is infrastructure as code. What that means is rather than having operators at a terminal logging into all nodes in the system and manually applying updates and patches, et cetera, instead we specify the desired state of the system as source code. And we rely on automation to uh, often at the node to detect any discrepancy between the actual state of that node and the system and the desired state. And then that automation is then responsible for essentially closing that gap and, and morphing the system into what it's required to be. And that's the only way to operate at kind of the scale that you see companies like Facebook and Netflix operating at. So once you have this infrastructure as code, and obviously the code is code, then the real challenge is um, instead of providing perimeter security for operators to exist in a safe environment to go around and manually modify all of these uh, nodes in the system. Well, instead we, we turn our attention to is the continuous integration and continuous deployment of those code changes from our source code repositories into production systems. And doing that in a repeatable, safe, uh, dependable kind of way. And in particular, we need to be able to test things. We need to be able to do deployments and I'm talking rolling deployments so that we can detect any issues and roll back if we need to. Um, and of course, we need to be able to do that securely. And so because the rate at which we're releasing features into those massive systems has just increased at a, at a crazy rate, you know, compared to the days when we used to do releases every few years and they would ship out on a, on a CD, the rate at which releases uh, new features are deployed into platforms today has, has grown significantly. So what that's required is that the security uh, community has had to change their mode of operation and kind of emerge from being the department of saying no at the final stages of a deployment to instead putting in place uh, automation, but specifically security guardrails so that this continuous integration and deployment can happen um, with a strong underpinning of robust security. And then the final kind of capability that I would bring attention to is site reliability engineering. And this emerged out of Google and it's often been described as what happens when, site, when software engineers are tasked with operations. What they tend to do is they will put in place telemetry to monitor and then service level objectives to 
um, to meet in order to assure that the system is operating as it should be. And then put in place automation to monitor the telemetry and to assure that services are operating as they should be and then to take corrective action if that's not the place. Now this stuff not so long ago was crazy. Um, and it was the path was forged by companies like Facebook, Amazon, Network and Google because they simply had no other alternative in order to operate at a scale that they had to operate. But over the last decade, we've seen this boil down to standard operating procedure for solo operators with their weekend side hustles. And my argument here is that we're gonna see the same thing um, with the concept of operations that are being developed today for the mega constellations such as Starlink, that's gonna become standard operating procedure for smaller startups like Miriota in the future. So <clears throat> where are we at? Like what's gonna happen? So my case here is that we're gonna move from, uh, as I mentioned before, focusing really intently on perimeter security to make secure operation centers and secure kind of um, zones for uh, operators to say if they want to update the pass schedule to copy a file you know to the ground station with the new pass schedule and what we're going to see is a move to internal apis so for example aws ground station as a service is a new service which is offered as an api with strong authentication and security at the edge and these are previously kind of internal to the perimeter but what this has done is bring kind of a zero trust approach of uh, always verify and it's brought it into the into the inner operations of the of the space segment space and ground segment and additionally um, we're going to move from hands-on operations with operators monitoring individual satellites and responding to anomalies and escalating and we're going to move towards a, a world where we're automating those responses if there's a run book which should be triggered in response to a set of observed and um, you know telemetry points then we're going to see a world where we're automating those things. And finally, um, we're going to see observability become critical. And I mean more than just observing um, kind of the back orbit telemetry from the last few orbits to identify what's going on in, a, in, a, uh, in an anomaly. I'm referring more to observing the impact of a deployment as it rolls out across a constellation detecting if we need to, if we're seeing any problems at a system level and then rolling that deployment back if we need to. These are the things that I see changing and coming out of um, the mega constellations that are happening today. So what needs to be done? I would argue that the government procurement process um, needs to recognize and embrace this shift so we're going to see a significant change in the, the basic concept of operations for space missions relative to what we've observed for the last kind of 10 to 20 years. In addition, as our agencies are kind of funding and supporting small companies and startups such as Miriota uh, to uplift and, and certify their, their cyber security footing, um, again, we need to get our heads around uh, these new concepts of operations and indeed embrace them and improve them where we can. The final thing I'd say is that obscurity is not really a thing anymore. Security by obscurity is not a thing. We need to invite hackers in to, to probe, to do penetration testing, to find vulnerabilities so that they can be addressed and fixed. And I think that the, um, the US Air Force challenge at uh, DEF CON over the last couple of years where they've actually put up a DOD satellite to, uh, to hackers to be able to try and take over. I think they were pointing the sun tracker at the moon or something like that. I think that that's a great example. Um, and it's something where it demonstrates something that we can do where we demand more from our agencies and prime contractors in terms of um, exposing their solutions and systems to people doing active penetration testing, searching for vulnerabilities. And finally, the thing that I'd like to finish with today is that um, we view, at Muriota, we view our deployment pipeline from our source code repository to our on-orbit satellite in terms of um, testing and deploying new features. We see that as just as critical to the successful satellite mission as what we see the rocket, you know, that the satellite is launched on. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you, Andrew. That's really, uh, 
really insightful and really interesting. I think it's been great uh, to have to have all three of you because we started with a view around how uh, cybersecurity needs to be flexible um, to suit CubeSats all the way up to uh, prime organisations. Uh, Giles obviously took us through uh, some of the challenges around the whole supply chain, whether that's at the uh, the CubeSat or the NanoSat. Uh, and um, but I think what's been consistent for all three of you is that view that cybersecurity needs to be baked in rather than seen as something that you add as an as an icing on the top or or sprinkles for for certain customers that want to pay for it. And I think actually what we've done by covering those topics in in such great depth, we've actually answered a couple of the questions that have come in around uh, how do we increase data security associated with nano satellites. We've we've all said it's actually something that needs to be as standard and. Um, uh, I think someone else has rightly put that sometimes it feels like it's a second thought, um, but how do we do that in a in a cost affordable way? And I think Andrew, the examples you gave for Miriota and and others to to potentially follow and and champion uh, starts to answer that. So so really the the question that I wanted to put from uh, from the audience to to you guys was about do we think we'll ever be it will ever be possible to eliminate all risks from these complex supply chains? Um, there's a follow-on question that, that asks if a nation really wants to hack, can we can we really stop them? And um, David, be interested in, in you starting off your thoughts, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to Giles and Andrew to fill in if they want to add. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And and today is is you know the exam question is where do the responsibilities lie, and how should governments and industries work together? Um, if you look at um, you know risks, especially from some of the more sophisticated ones. Uh, such as national threats and also advanced persistence threats, which are sort of quasi-national. Uh, the answer is uh, on our own, you know, in industry, we, we can do 80% of it. We, we, we can deter some risk just by being, you know, harder to get into uh, than others, uh, you know, elsewhere in, in, in other nations. Um, but this is where we have to look at the relationship between industry and individual governments, i.e., um, what we do about the residual 20% of risk, because we need the specialist skills in order to get uh, you know, as early warning as we can, and then to provide response you know, capacity uh, once we under, uh, understand an attack uh, has, you know, is, is underway. Um, so in the United Kingdom, we have the National Cyber Security Centre, which provides that essential you know, government to in industry link, which industry can report into, and then summon up the response mechanisms for those uh, more difficult threats. So that is, you know, th there's the relationship between, you know, a single government and its its national industry. But I also think that there is, um, um, you know, the government to government information sharing as well um, that can, you know, look at these risks, you know, and provide a collective capacity in order to, you know, inform what needs to be done, you know, especially against the more more difficult threats. Eighty percent of this should responsibility should lie between the you know uh, should lie with the with the industry with it with the the, the satellite or, or space system operator the 20 percent more difficult thing is where there has to be a, a highly integrated uh, relationship uh, with the government to provide that expertise to reduce that risk thank you and Andrew, you obviously talked a bit about uh, some of the challenges that that DoD and others have put up in in starting to um, foster that 80-20 role that David was just describing. So I think you wanted to, to add on this question about the complex supply chains. So I don't know if we can if we can stop events or if, if we can um, prove, if we can keep attackers out. Um, and from my perspective, I just assume that they're in the network. And so then that shifts the problem to um, limiting the blast radius and, and restricting um, lateral movement. Uh, if they are in, and also, yeah, you know, as I said, with the with the um, kind of encryption from device to network that we have, just restricting what they can do if they happen to breach a, a particular component. And so, especially, I think the big thing to do is to move away from that perimeter security, where once you get in, you can do whatever you want, and uh, we need to kind of authenticate and verify at every interface within the system. That's the way that I would tackle the problem. Brilliant. Thank you. And then, Giles, finally, you obviously talked a lot about uh, the need to look at it from a supply chain point of view, but is there anything you wanted to add? 
Uh, well, I think Dave and Andrew have, have given a very good response there, uh, you know, and the question is, can we stop it? Uh, the sad answer to that is probably no, not in 100% of cases. Um, does that mean we shouldn't try? Absolutely not. Um, but what I would say is, is part of the, the whole cybersecurity ethos is, is not just about um, stopping incidents. Uh, it's also how you manage them when they happen uh, and therefore understanding um, your supply chain, where your data is, or what controls you've got, how you can how you can manage an incident when it happens is is equally important as stopping it in the first place. Um, as we've seen, you know, some some good companies um, with good cybersecurity hygiene can be unlucky. You can still get uh, you can still get breached. Um, so uh, having an understanding of those risks, where your data is, how you you know having those relationships with your suppliers so you can manage those incidents when it happens, I think is is just as important as stopping it in the first place. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. And David, you obviously started the day talking uh, about industry 4.0 um, and, and the moves there. And Andrew obviously concluded by looking at some of the examples from, from Facebook or Amazon. And, and you can look to Netflix for the work that they did with the, the sort of the chaos monkey example. And it certainly looks like from from that uh, sector's perspective, they are moving to moving beyond the uh, resilience being uh, introducing failure into their manufacturing lines through things like the Chaos Monkey um, uh, open source competitions and maybe moving to a way in which resilience is, is more grown than designed in. Um, and uh, Craig has asked a question about how, how do we do that as obviously uh, the space age enters its fourth uh, fourth wave or, or goes beyond its third wave and looks to things like the mega constellations that Andrew touched on and uh, the Leo piece. So, so Craig's question is about how different do we think detecting or dealing with incidents on satellites in Leo will be versus a, a standard network, given that operations will only have an access to satellites for a, for a short period as it passes over uh, for, for ground stations. So. Um, if David, yeah. if you wanted to start uh, on that one, and we'll, we'll make this the final question, just conscious of, of everyone's okay. time. Right, I, I got that, John. And and um, you know, yes, the uh, the you know the big fat targets providing strategic uh, capacity sitting out there geostationary. You know, they don't move, um, and and you know, and they might be older as well. And you know, a question came up yesterday about what about the satellites, which are, you know, 10 years plus, you know, really before space and cyber really kind of kicked off and the vulnerabilities uh, were recognized. And I think the fact is, you know, you have an LEO, you know, satellite whizzing around at, you know, 12,000 miles an hour or whatever provides a, an, um, uh, you know, a level of, uh, you know, protection. You know, you have to be quick to access the satellite and, you know, but there are very complex pathways here. And that's what I think is, one of the key things is, you know, mapping the potential attack pathways, especially from the more sophisticated threats, and then coming up with, you know, strategies to resolve those risks. And as the point was made earlier, what happens if a, uh, an attack is actually successful? What is your failover? What's your redundancy look like? You know, and, and how can you actually continue to provide even a base uh, level of service? Uh, and yeah, I think that's a very, you know, strong point is some, some, as it were, you know, targets might be more difficult purely because of their physical attributes, i.e. they're whizzing around so fast. Um, but in the end, it's all hyper-connected. Um, so your attack pathway can be actually quite complex. So these are the kind of thoughts you need to be coming in with your, your risk assessment and get the risk assessment up to board level. You know, this cyber is not a you know, an issue for, for the techies in the basement, uh, you know, uh, you know, this has to get onto the corporate risk registers, even for a, a small and growing company, the back of the mind, this nag to say, have we covered this off? Is this going to cripple my company, um, you know, in the future? And look at how government can actually support um, you in, in developing your response or, or your resilience measures. Charles, um, anything you wanted to uh, to, to add on to today. Yeah, key thing I would add to that, which I, I think um, is absolutely uh, understanding your risks, um, knowing what your risks are, is is the key to any security function. If you don't know what your risks, your, what your risks are, you can't manage them. Um, so I think I think that's the key message I would uh, take away. 
Great. And then Andrew, um, final final thoughts from you, particularly given your experience with Miriota and and you know what you're already doing from a Leo point of view. Any thoughts on how the mega constellations uh, should respond or yes. be thinking about this? So my simple answer is is diversity. Um, and so one of the things that we have in contact in, in um, uh, one of the things that we have in common with say the Starling constellation is that encryption across the space and ground segment, which means that if you are somehow getting access to a LEO satellite, you're not able to interfere with the, with the network traffic that's traversing through it. You may be able to shut down and deny availability, but then the system as a whole can respond through by exploiting diversity, essentially to become resilient to the loss or breach of an individual node. That's brilliant. Thank you. And, and thank you to, to all of our speakers for, for another um, really important session that we've had in, in this collaboration between UK and Australia. I think it's been great that all three of you have talked about the need to constantly learn together and collaborate um, between organisations, between organisations and government and um, in a bilateral, multilateral approach. So um, really excited that we've got a, a third and final session tomorrow. Um, please make sure that you can uh, try and join that if you can. It will be a chance to uh, not only have another uh, discussion, but also a chance to network with with speakers, with each other, um, and start to really forge ahead with those communities that we want to see grow, we want to see become a default uh, and being baked into the ways in which we work from, uh, as, as we've all said, from the top of our supply chain all the way, all the way down into all of the staff members as well. Um, so really appreciate all of the speakers for giving up their time uh, this morning, this evening and this afternoon, depending on which time zones you guys are all in. Um, and really looking forward to seeing a number of our attendees tomorrow as well. Uh, we're going to sign off now and um, uh, ask the organisers to, to stop recording and, uh, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.